I know a guy that knows the president of some club, or I know the guy that knows the coach of some club. And, you know, everyone gets into the pro game and the college game in different ways. Like whether it's the best skilled player or it's who they know, you know, that's just the reality of life. Hello, and welcome to the Kick It With Katie podcast. Hey team, it's Katie here, and today I have with me Brooks Lane Beer, and he is the Midwest Region Scout for, is that right? Yes, correct. For Soccer Syndicate. Soccer Syndicate, okay. (laughs) Yeah, that's okay. (laughs) I was like, I know it's a big, long title, so I'm like, I'm going to forget something. But anyway, so why don't you go ahead and tell... Everybody, Brooks, tell everybody. Oh, and also forgot this part. He is also one of the hosts of the We Are Soccer show. Um, Love the guys over there. Love (laughs) listening to them. Um, But anyway, so he is also on there. But Brooks, why don't you go ahead and tell us your background in soccer before we get into your what your current role is as a scout? Yeah. So, I mean, like every kid, right? You grew up in, you know, you played different sports. And, you know, for me, it was soccer, baseball, basketball. And as I kind of grew older, um, you know, baseball and soccer became my main sports. And then, you know, I think I really honestly fell in love with soccer probably in college. You know, I, I took a little a little time off. I didn't play soccer in college. I could have played at the, the, the D3 level um, at a small school in Indiana, but I didn't really want to. So I went to Michigan State. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think like missing soccer and, and, and the fun of it and then picking up on the EPL because the NBC Sports was happening then. And like, you know, this is probably like 2010, 11, where like NBC Sports got the rights and you could watch all the games, you know, you didn't have to pay for Peacock mm-hmm. and everything. And, you know, so the, my, my love grew there. And, and honestly, at Michigan State, I, I was a journalism major. Um, and I did cover the MSU men's and women's soccer team for WDBM. That's the student radio station at Michigan state. It's very, you know, very, uh, a good student TV, uh, a good student radio station. Um, one always wins multiple awards every year, you know, for college radio stations. Um, and I worked for the state news for a semester. Um, so, you know, uh, but, but covering the men's and women's soccer team, at Michigan state, you know, I followed and did that. And then, um, you know, it just, you know, kind of escalated everything. You know, I, I eventually got into soccer, did some, uh, you know, more soccer stuff, youth coaching. And, you know, I just kind of found that coaching on the field wasn't really my thing. Um, mm-hmm. And then I worked my way on to the, as an assistant coach on the Lawrence Tech University, which is an NAIA school here in Michigan. It's based in Southfield, mm-hmm. Michigan. And I did more of like the budgeting, but I also did like scouting your opponent because in the NAI, you're allowed to go scout your opponent. So I write up opposition reports and then I'd also um, do video uh, analysis with the boys, with the varsity players. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I just take the matches, cut them up, say, hey, like st- tactically we could do this, this and this better. Or, you know, individual stuff with players like, hey, like you can turn here and this makes sense. Or like, you know, take the ball back with the outside of your foot and play. So it was more the detail of the game that maybe they weren't getting in, in training sessions. Um, so I do that, like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, probably a couple months, you know, out of the, you know, the three month season, you know, just to, to help the boys and, and everything. So, um, and then from there, I kind of jumped into scouting. Um, actually, honestly, I was scouting when I was doing Lawrence tech and doing some youth coaching. Um, it was kind of actually by, 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 uh, by chance that I actually got into this. So I was kind of just looking for something to add to my resume and I took a class through, it's called Sports Management Worldwide. And that's where mm-hmm. I met um, a guy named Matt Martin. Uh, he had been scouting for Red Bull, SKC, and he had just moved to the Portland Timbers. Um, and he took some of his staff with him. And I took the class and Matt and I got along and we, you know, we text and email about players in college. And because that was the main thing they were doing, they were scouting college soccer to prep the Timbers mm-hmm. and and he, you know, when he was at SKC, they prep SKC for the draft when, you know, you could find a lot of good players in college soccer that, you know, could play for the mm-hmm. first team. And, um, so yeah, from there I did a little internship with them and then I joined the staff and, and when I say like scout, like this has always been a part-time job, um, as the, as the, as the scouting game grows or the scouting industry in, in soccer grows in this country with the more money that's been invested, there's more full-time jobs and better part-time pay. 
you know, but I've been doing this for probably about eight and a half, nine years, probably coming up on 10 mm -hmm. years soon. So um, it's a, it's a love, it's a, it's a thing you do for the love of it. Um, I have a full-time job, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of my role and just kind of how, you know, I fell in love with the game and, and kind of where I got today. So. Yeah, that's pretty cool experience. Cause I know that a lot of players and I've talked about it before, they yeah. kind of wonder what avenues they can take to mm -hmm. stay in the game mm -hmm. after the game. Yep. And obviously scouting is one that you could get into if that's something that you like going in. I mean, I've obviously been at events where I have seen scouts yeah. all over the place. And so yeah. I know some of the biggest questions that people have um, are things like, you know, what does a scout do? What does a scout look for? Yep. Um, what, like, is there something specific, like something for me, like, do coaches send people out specifically to look for a specific type of player to fill a hole that maybe they've, mm -hmm. that they're missing, you know, do they do that? Um, so what would like for you as a scout, like, mm -hmm. um, for what you do, what can people expect from? for a scout to do and what are they looking for in mm -hmm. players at like we just were at the Las Vegas or not Las Vegas um surf college showcase mm -hmm. I think is what it was over Thanksgiving yeah. we were there and there were hundreds of scouts there yeah. so um probably met some of your friends and people <laughs> that you probably know from yeah. sitting on the sidelines of games so yep. what are some things that you guys are looking for when you go up to a game because I've seen coaches that will or scouts that will literally go up to a field be there for five minutes, get their chair and move on. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you guys are looking for? Yeah. So, you know, I think first of all, with the soccer syndicate, you know, so we contract with MLS and USL clubs and just, just to kind of give you like a base of what we do. And then I'll go into the question is, you know, so mm -hmm. we contract with clubs doing college soccer, youth soccer and lower division pro. So USL and NISA. Um, and from there, a lot of our clients give us different things to look for. It could be specific types of players they want by position, by skills. They could just want us to go out to matches and just look at for the best player um, or for players mm -hmm. that are really interesting. So, so to get into your question, I think when we're at matches, um, and this could be if you're a college, you're a co you know you see a college coach that's a recruiting or just a, you know an academy scout or, or someone in my role that contracts with clubs and such is. You know, it, it's a little bit of everything. You know, when I go out personally, when I see a team for the first time, I don't do a whole lot of research on players. I I like to go in blind, and I think every scout's a little different. Some guys like to go in knowing what they're to expect, but I think when you go in blind, you give every kid a fair shot that's on the field. Every every player mm -hmm. out there, the 22 that on the field plus the subs, you give everyone a fair shot. You, you just you kind of take your notebook, you write everything down, obviously write the lineups down. You know, if you got numbers, obviously write the numbers down and everything. And, and then if you have names, you add that in your notes and such. If, you know, the, you know, the man, team managers give you names of players and everything. But, you know, you mm -hmm. just go down, take as many notes as you can. And, and it's different for everything. So if you're in a big tournament, I'd say like, like the Surf Cup Showcase you are at, and I've been to a lot of them as well, but I'm last next once, you know, I've been out to MLS Next Flex. You know, I've been to ECNL stuff and, and, you know, like local showcases, you know, the Michigan Jags here in Michigan do a local showcase out of the Wolves. And, you know, it, it's different, you know, when it's, when you've got so many fields going on in so many age groups, you know, sometimes we're only watching 30 minutes a half because, you know, maybe our goal for this is we want to get as, we want to identify player as many players as we can at one event because we may never see mm -hmm. that player again because, if I'm from Michigan and I go out to MLS Next Flex and I only see Midwest teams, you know, I don't really see besides video and I love to live scout. I don't like to watch, like I will watch video. I mean, as a scout, you need to, but I love watching players in their, in, in, at live because mm -hmm. it tells you so much more about a player than video does. Video hides things. You can't see everything. Sometimes the camera doesn't move properly. Um, so Live scouting is the best thing you could do. But if I go to like an MLS Next Flex event in in, in Maryland, um, or, or, or Virginia it is, um, or no, so mm -hmm. Boyd's Maryland it was in, um, you know, I want to see every other team I can. So I'm looking at the MLS academies in the Southeast, the Northeast, the West Coast. 
the not MLS academies. And honestly, I don't have time when we're trying as a group to identify top players for our purposes in database that I'm not, I'm going to stay for a game for 60 minutes, but right. You know, if it's a college game, you know, college is a little different. It's, you know, one game and you know, it's, it's one game, you know, sometimes we'll go to multiple games on the weekend if the, if the time's separated properly, but, you know, for college games, I'm always there pretty much for the entire game, unless the game is kind of dull or it gets really lopsided. Um, but even mm-hmm. for youth matches, though, you know, so the local MLS next games, you know, I stick around for the Vardar, Wolves, Jags, you know, I'll watch the 13s to the 19s, and that's a really long day. That's a six-hour day. Probably by the mm-hmm. 19s, I'm like, okay, I've watched 75 minutes of this game. I'm probably ready to go because I'm tired and hungry. But, you know, it's it's different, you know, and we're all looking for different things in players, to be honest with you. Um you know, college coaches may be looking for specific for, for specific players and positions. Um, depending on what age you are, you know, they may be needing a player for the next, you know, they're like the 2024 class, most colleges are probably done with. But the 2025 class, a lot of them, you know, may be looking at 17s and 19s and, you know, maybe starting to dip into the 16s to see what, you know, the 2025, 2026 class may be. So, you know, for me, you know, for me, it's just I'm like mostly looking for the best talented players out in the field, um, and kids that have something. You ha- see a lot of kids that are very much late late bloomers in this in this country, and I think mm-hmm. as as we start to grow in the sport even more in this country, um, it'll it, you and you'll still see that, but it may not be as many. But you know, you're always looking for the under the radar kids that you know get missed out on MLS Next Academies that you know could play at a good D1 program or. You know, maybe there's a 15, 16, you know, that wasn't picked up at 14 by an MLS Academy that, you know, could jump in at the 17 level. Obviously, you have to be a very high quality player to do that because you're bumping out some kids, um, you know, in that MLS right. Academy at 17. But there's just a lot of different things we look for. Um, you know, if we want to go by position, you know, like goalkeeper, you know, shot stopper, your hands, how good, are, you know, um, can you keep the ball in the back of the net? I think that's the first thing. I think a lot of player people look for like distribution, and I think distribution is a very important part of the game as a goalkeeper. But you got to keep the ball in the net. You know that's the key goalkeeper's job at the end of the day, right? Outside backs, mm-hmm. outside backs. You get forward, you get into the attack. How are you as one? How are you as one v one defenders? Do you combine going forward? Um, do you get stuck in on the defensive end? You know, obviously athleticism for any player is a standout thing. Um, but mm-hmm. if you're not as athletic, you know, how do you see the game, read the game and how technical a player are you? Um, do you make quick decisions? Not necessarily always playing one to two touch, but just making the right decision to turn out a pressure to play the right ball, um, and to be in the right place defensively, uh, center backs, obviously covering in space, you know, aerial, how good are you in the air? Do you break lines with passes? Can you ping a long ball, a long diagonal ball? Um, you know, do you get up and block shots? You know, it, you know, do you get stuck in? Uh, obviously, midfielders, you switch the point of attack. Um, do you play forward? You know, as a midfielder, I think in today's game, you just can't really play east to west and south. Um, I see a lot mm-hmm. of kids like that where they don't check their shoulder and they just play backwards or they turn and play sideways. Um, I think a lot of coaches today honestly want kids that can play the ball forward and use both feet as well. So, you know, depending on how, how high the midfield position you play, if you're a box to box eight or you're going to be a 10 that's very creative. You know, I think you got to get some assists and score some goals, honestly. I think that's what the game kind of expects today. The six, I know people, you know, Craig and I, and we are soccer top ones all the time. You know, Craig likes this. Craig's like, oh, a six got to, has to score some goals and contribute. I, I disagree. I tend to think that if I want, if I have a six, I want him to be purely defensive. Can he get some assists every now and then? That's good. But can he cover ground and, you know, can he get stuck in and, and is he good technically? As a winger in the, in anyone in the front three, honestly is how many goal how, can you score goals and can you create opportunities and get assists? Because mm-hmm. the one thing kids don't understand is that, and this is where I think watching the game really helps, whether anyone that lives by a USL team, an MLS team, a college program, you know, I think watching the game at every level is super important because you need to kind of see, you need to tell yourself, am I that player? Am I that good? Um, what do I need to work on to improve my game? And what kids don't realize when they jump up in the youth level to college and then college to the pros is that at some point, everyone changes positions. You know, if you're a midfielder, mm-hmm. it's not super technical that that covers ground, maybe right back is your position, or maybe it's a center back. If you're a bigger midfielder, that's a defend, you know, the defensive mid that's six, two, six, one, that's athletic. You know, maybe you jump into the center back position. If you're a winger and you can't score goals, 
you know, what good are you for me at the, at the, at the pro level where I need my guys to score goals because I need to win games. Mm-hmm. So maybe you're moving back into a wing back position or an outside back position. Um, I've seen center forwards. I think Nick DePew is a good one. He's, you know, he's a kid that was at UCSB. He kind of bounced around between left center back and center forward. And, you know, for a little while he was playing center forward and then the LA Galaxy moved him back to left center back. And um, I know he's been kicking around a bit. He was at Nashville. I don't know if he's anywhere else now, Nick, but, you know, he found a spot at left center back and he's had a decent little career from that. So, you know, being open mm-hmm. to the change of position is extremely important, in my opinion. If you're a versatile player that could do versatile things, I think it makes it gives the coach an easier idea of how they can use you in their system. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I I did not know um, Robert Lewandowski mm-hmm. used to be a defender. <laughs> yes, I didn't know that until like a month or two ago. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if it was my husband or something that I saw, but I was like, what? Mm-hmm. And Justice was just like, yeah, he was a defender. And I'm like, he was like goal scorer, you mm-hmm. know, like that is his been his job for the last however many years. Like, and he was like, yeah. And I mean, it, it's something that I've seen players in the youth program that I'm a part of where we'll have a center back who all of a sudden, like, if we need goals, that kid is now center forward mm-hmm. because he can get the job done. You know, he can do it on both ends. He can move around on the field. Like, mm-hmm. I, I've seen that, you know, and but um, so it, it's definitely really important for a player to be versatile. I know, um, like, I, I just got off of another interview with a player who is currently at one of our local colleges. And he was talking about, you know, he's played at the college that he is currently at. He's like, I probably have played four different, I think it was like four different positions since I've played for the team, you know, Mm and, and he's just been able to slot in wherever the coach needs him. You know, Mm -hmm. you need to be versatile. And that's something I know some players want and there's other players that don't understand that um i know i've personally tried to move players around with some of the teams that i coach Mm -hmm. and it's been really for some of them it's been really good for others it's been a challenge but i think a good challenge because it's made them realize that when other players are in those positions and you're playing this position like if you know they are covering for you or you need to cover for them or, or whatever it is like understanding that everybody's roles on the field is really important as well. Um, so as a college or not college, I mean, you could be college scout, but yeah. as a scout, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, yeah. um so anyway, things. um, yeah, as a scout, um, what are some, do you guys look for, off the field attributes as well. Is that anything that you guys take note of, or is it, is it literally just mostly just on the field stuff? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, like how's your body language during a game when something doesn't go well, or, you know, you're down three, four, zero, are you still trying, you know, are you still putting the effort in, um, off the field stuff, a hundred percent. I mean, listen, no kid is perfect, right? Like we're all mm-hmm. young. We were all young at once, you know, we are all young once and we all have done things that are stupid and, you know, it, but it all depends how you, you know, how do you grow as a player? You know, I mean, you know, there's been some college kids, you know, over the years where, you know, we talk to coaches and, you know, they've, they've made mistakes, you know, have they been bad mistakes? No, but like, you know, some silly stuff of like, you know, but there was one example of a kid where like he got booted or his car was going to get booted or something. So he drove away from the cops and that's a felony, obviously, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, I've known kids that, you know, have you know, to, they make an extra money on some stuff outside of the uh, outside of soccer. You know, on their own time, they get some stuff, and you know, they're you know, they're you know, maybe they're <laughs> getting in the wrong thing a little bit by selling to the wrong people or whatever. And you know, I get it. Like you know, everyone tries to you know live their own life and want to make their own money and everything. But you know, we definitely taking those attributes of the players. You know, what they do off the field, and also th- their parents. I mean. I sit, I literally, I, I kid you not, I sit right in the middle of, of the parents. You know, like, mm-hmm. I sit at the halfway line every time I can because that's the best view for me at youth games mm-hmm. uh, because I can see both sides evenly. College games, I'm always on the top of the press box, and I can I can get that. I'm afforded that because, you know, 
most college stadiums have a press box that I can stand on top of. There are a few in the Midwest where I have to sit by the parents and, and other people. But, you know, for the youth game, it's mostly, you know, unless you're playing at a high school field or a college field or something, every once in a while you can you can sit up higher. But I'm always in around the parents. So I'm I'm listening to, you know, the parents and what they say. Are they telling their players what to do? Um, you know, and I think a lot of what the parents say and do, to be honest with you, tells me a lot about how their child is. Um, and I can tell sometimes with the way they react about fouls and complain. And, you know, so character is a big thing, honestly. You know, uh, you know, I if someone asks me about how the kid's character is and, you know, I'll say, hey, it's, 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 it's this. And, you know, I don't think it helps that dad doesn't really, uh, you know, doesn't help that by just, uh, you know, berating the kid or, or arguing with the referee the whole time. And, you know, so you're looking at a lot of different things. And honestly, I've known stories from from people where parents get too involved in things and it's hurt them getting a pro contract by getting into a certain university or, you know, pushing and making it into an MLS academy. Um, you know, as a parent, I think you really need to stay hands off. Um, not, not everything, but I think you really need to leave the decision up to the kid. And then obviously it's a family decision, right? It's, you know, if a kid... Mm-hmm. You know, we have a few kids. I mean, I know you're based in Utah. I mean, we have a few kids in, from Michigan, Blake Kelly, Jude Wellings, and um, mm-hmm. Cam Estala, who play for the RSL Academy. And, you know, that's a family yep. decision, you know, traveling away from the Midwest to RSL. And, you know, that's something everyone has to talk about to see if it's right for you. And, you know, there are some kids that have, you know, because Michigan's free territory for you for youth soccer. So, you know, that's something, honestly, that, um, you know, has to be discussed with the family to see if that's the right move and decision. And, you know, what I've honestly told player people, in my opinion, is, you know, you'll know what the right environment is. I mean, I've, uh, there's kids mm-hmm. from Michigan that have gone to like three or four different academies. And, you know, I always tell them, I always tell the, the parents and the players, ask questions to, because you'll mm-hmm. figure out very quickly if you're wanted there, if there's a plan for you, if, you know, right. where do you, where do they see you, uh, you know, within the system and the process. So, um, you know, so it's, you know, like that's jumping outside the character stuff, obviously I'm kind of going into the, into the, you know, the, the recruitment process and such now, but um, you know, I think that's part of the process though, during the recruitment process, you're going to know the parent as well. So, but definitely character off the field, hundred percent. That's something that, you know, we definitely look at. Yeah. And I know that there's a lot of people who I think get worried because their kid's not a starter Mm -hmm. and you know, they're like, well, my kid's, probably not going to get scouted because they're not starting. They're not playing the whole game. You know, they get subbed in for, you know, the last 15 minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know, of a game type of a thing. And so how can people, cause like I know of an example of a player that stuck it out and played basically as the backup to one of the starters on the team. And he knew his role and his dad had a long conversation with him. Do you want to stay with this team where you're coming off the bench all the time? Or do you want to go somewhere else that you can be a starter? And he's like, no, I want to stay because he knew his role and he would get subbed on for the last, I don't know, however many minutes of each half or whatever it was. So he didn't get to play all that much, but he still ended up being a college athlete. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, is that for players who maybe are in that position, how do you guys scout those types of players or look at them? Yeah, it's, so I think going to the question of every parent has is like, does my kid need to start all the time to get identified? And clearly that's never the case. Um, You know, look at Roman Celitano. Roman Celitano went to IU. He was a backup on the on the soccer teams he played on he was a backup goalkeeper and look at this kid like you know buys his time you know he's sitting behind i think it was trey muse he's sitting behind at iu who trey just signed with the program timbers was with the charleston battery last year signed a homegrown deal with the seattle sounders and mm-hmm. you know he buy you know he bought his time and you know he got the starting job for a few years at iu and look at you become a top pick in the mls draft you you kind of buy your time a little bit more at FC Cincy. You jump into the role, look what you do. And, you know, now he's a starter and look, he's now he's in the January men's national team camp right now. So, you know, the, for, for players, obviously playing is, is extremely important, but I think you have to figure out what the right situation is for you. Mm-hmm. I would always say that the better, the, you want to always be in a better competition setup. Um, 
especially if it's something local. Um, now, if you're traveling, you know, across the country to play in the MLS Academy where you're not going to get a lot of minutes and you're kind of sitting there and you're miserable, it's a different environment. I think that's a whole other question you have to ask yourself is, is right. it worth it or is it worth it to stay with my local team and play and develop and get better and then maybe do some extra training stuff outside of practice? Um, mm-hmm. That's something that you always have to ask yourself. But for me, I'm whether you sub in for 15 minutes at a showcase or, you know, you you know, the 10 game, you know, it's like a 30 game season. You come off the bench, 20 of them, and you start 10 of them. You know, it doesn't matter to me. Like how you show on the field is all that matters to me. Um, that's all it is at the end of the day. It's how you show on the field and what you do with those minutes that you're given. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of players at the college level that I think honestly should have been starters um, that have were just super, you know, sub, you know, role bench players. And it worked for yeah. them. It was it worked for them. That was their role. And, you know, some, you know, went on to play professional soccer and some have jobs, you know, just normal people jobs. So, but everyone has their role in the team. And it's not like you cannot be not identified if you're a sub or if you're a starter every game. Um, you know, we're just looking for different things, different attributes, physicality, technical ability. Um, you're looking at the whole stuff, whole, all the stuff we've talked about you know, early in this podcast. So, mm-hmm. Um, so like the, so like the college surf showcase Mm -hmm. that, um, I just went to, I spoke to another coach who his, he had a team there and they were in, they weren't in like the best of the best. Their team was like in the next one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. They were in a different division, a lower, Mm -hmm. a lower bracket. Yeah. Um, and so he was disappointed in the number of scouts at his games. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I know, at least from my experiences, usually the scouts are going to go to those bigger games. Yep. So what is, what is something that those, I mean, basically if a scout shows up to your field, mm-hmm. you know, perform, mm-hmm. um, I mean, you should be performing whether or not they're there. Yep. Um, but, but what is like I mean, I guess, I don't know if, like, you guys are told to go see as many games as possible. Maybe at an event, you're like, I want to go, like you said earlier, you know, sometimes I'll stay and I'll be there all day and I'll watch, Mm -hmm. you know, a half of every game. Mm -hmm. Um, When you go to some of these events, um, maybe you're looking at, you know, the teams that aren't in your area. Mm -hmm. Um, So our our scouts, I mean, obviously scouts still showed, maybe it was only one or two went to these lower division ones because, like you said, you're sometimes looking for the odd player that maybe got looked over. Maybe mm-hmm. their team's from a smaller, smaller market. Yep. And so that's why they weren't there in the best of the best group or mm-hmm. whatever. And so what it, what I'm, I'm trying to figure out what mm-hmm. I'm trying to say. Like, how does it determine where you guys go and look? Um, sure. Is it just off the cuff um, when you're at a tournament like that? Yeah. So I think for all of us, you know, like, it depends what you're scouting for, who you're scouting for. So Mm -hmm. if it's example, like me, where, you know, we're just trying to identify players and we're trying to identify not only top players, but the players that are missed, you know, if I was doing this full time, you know, Mm -hmm. I would get out, you know, in Michigan, we have MLS next ECNL, NAL, um, you know, we have USYS, obviously. You know, I yeah. would try to at least identify all the players on those teams. Now, you know, we have a lot of clubs in the greater in the greater Detroit area. Then we have some obviously on the west side of the state, you know, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, a few teams in Lansing, you know, which are a couple hours from me where mm-hmm. I live. So um, you know, if I was doing this full time for the soccer syndicate, I would be trying I would be trying to identify all the top players I could, especially for the clients in our youth space, because there's always a kid somewhere that it's a team that's affordable for the, for the family that maybe they can't mm-hmm. afford to go play for an MLS next team because of all the training and everything. And there's no scholarship program. Um, right. That is the one big drawback in this country is it's so big in, in new sports in general, not just soccer are so expensive for players that it's just, mm-hmm. they can't, they can't do it. Like some, some kids don't want to play high school soccer. That's the only soccer they can do besides pickup. Um, yeah, you know, inner city kids, like 
you know, playing pickup with friends and, you know, uh, you know, in different, you know, there's different European leagues they have, you know, the, there's Mexican league and there's a you know, Eastern European league, you know, and all different cities and d- different things that happen. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that's the tough part about this country is getting across, you know, t- to every level in the scout. So for me, I would look at everyone if I could, um, if you're going to mm-hmm. talk about probably a college coach or probably an MLS scout, like an academy scout, they're probably only looking at the top teams in ECNL, USYS, um, you know, ML, obviously MLS next, uh, you know, NAL, you know, and then the NAL have like some A-teams and a mixture of like, you know, MLS next B teams in there. So, you know, if they're looking for the top guys, you know, it's tough for a showcase because I've been on those teams where I've coached where, you know, we're not playing the top division and there's no one there. And, you know, you just got to perform. Mm-hmm. You just, you just got to perform and, you know, see what happens. You can go to ID camps for college. So if this is in relation to, I want to play college soccer at a higher level, you know, going to ID camps and, you know, trying to get your way into, you know, maybe that's where you got to make the change and, you know, maybe I'm happy playing on my team, but maybe I need to go to another team where, you know, maybe I don't get as many minutes, but, you know, I'm out and about and, you know, you know, I may, I may play better, you know, better teams on a better team, or better competition. So then I can get in front of those, those, uh, those scouts and college coaches and such. So it's not a perfect mm-hmm. system. It's always going to be flawed. Um, I mean, I could tell you probably a lot of the, the, the kids that, you know, for the U S youth national teams, you know, that I know of that I've seen, you know, they get called into youth national team camp. I don't think all those kids are always the best players. Um, and I would probably honestly tell you that a lot of the guys I talk with in the game feel the same way. Um, mm-hmm. it could be very, you know, political sometimes, you know, as soccer is in this country. Um, mm-hmm. and that's just all levels, not just the, not just us soccer and the national team and such, but you know, right. it's, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy to, to, to be in that situation at a showcase where you're playing in the lower division and, you know, and, and you don't get seen, but you, the reality is too, is people have to understand is that, not everyone can play college soccer and not everyone's going to play at the next level. That's just the thing people Mm -hmm. have to realize. And it's hard to accept. There's a lot of, you know, there's actually a lot of men's programs. There's not a lot of D1 men's programs, but there's D2, there's NAIA. You know, if you explore all your options, I think that's good. There's, you know, there's JUCO programs. You go play for two years and then transfer. Um, Mm -hmm. But everyone just has to realize that, you know, at some point your soccer career ends, whether, you know, like for me, it was at the end of high school. You know, for me, it was just mm-hmm. I didn't want to play in college. It's for some guys, some guy, you know, guys to go to college, play four years. And, you know, they're like, I'm done. Like, whether it's because I want a job that pays me nicely or I'm just not good enough to play at the next level. Um, you know, mm-hmm. and this game keeps expanding in, in the United States. There's more UPSL teams. There's more USL2. You know, there's more club teams that pop up and merge. And, you know, there's more pro teams that are being formed. But in reality, you really have to think about this. And I don't think people really do all the time is that this is an international game. Like, this is different from mm-hmm. NFL, MLB, NBA, hockey. You know, it's, I mean, hockey's international to an extent, but not. it's not like soccer where every country plays the game. You know, mm-hmm. so there's a lot of players out there that player people are trying to identify that think, you know, especially the pro game, that, you know, they feel like they can make a difference for their team rather than the local domestic kid. And whether it's mm-hmm. right or wrong that they do that, you know, that's just how it is, unfortunately. So, like I said, you got to show up all the time when you play. You got to be consistent. You can't just show up for one game and, and be be mediocre for four and then good on the, you know, good on the sixth game. You know, you got to be, you know, one, two, three, four, good, okay on the fourth, and then, you know, aver- you know decent on the fifth game, you know. So, it's just, you got to mm-hmm. be consistent with your play. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I know... Um we've had some players who kind of do that where they get in there at like the first round of a tournament. They're great in group play. Mm -hmm. They're a little shaky, maybe in the quarters or semis, and then they disappear in the final. And it's like, dude, that's when we need you clutch (laughs) is in that final. Like that's what we've been working for. This is the biggest, you know, and, and so it's hard for, especially, um, players who are hoping to get like a scholarship Mm -hmm. or get looked at by anybody, you know, when you go into a final of something Mm -hmm. and 
they kind of, it's really disheartening and it's hard to see like as a coach or a parent and, and seeing the player not be able, cause you go, I know that they have it in them, but that's also something that, you know, as a scout is something that you're looking for, you know, did they just disappear in this game? Um, cause they obviously need players that are going to be consistent and um, are going to be able to show up. And Mm -hmm. so that's definitely something that you need to make sure that you do. Because, like, I even know um, kids that are siblings who one of the kids will show up every game, give the full, and the other one will be so emotional. And um, they could be just as good as their sibling, if not better, but their attitude is kind of what kills them. Mm -hmm. You know, because I feel like because their older sibling did so well that – maybe they just think it's going to happen. So definitely make sure that um, you're working for yourself and not off of anybody else's credentials. Make sure that you're proving yourself, I guess, when you're on the field. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think there was a question that I was going to ask you. Yeah. Well, I just kind of go, I'll, I kind of, I kind of kind of piggyback off what you said about like, you know, mm-hmm. siblings going to play, you know, I've seen a lot of players, you know, their older sibling goes and plays D1 at some big university, but they're not the, you know, the middle child is not the same level and they're going to play the lower university. And, you know, I've seen, you know, obviously, you know, maybe guys, the high level youth players get into the professional game right away and don't have to do the college route. And then the middle child has to take a little different route. So it's not equal for everyone. And I think people need to understand yeah. that is, you know, and I've seen a lot of people like with a lot of money do like, Hey, this, I, I know people like, I, I know a guy that knows the president of some club, or I know the guy that knows the coach of some club. And, you know, everyone gets into the pro game and the college game in different ways. Like mm-hmm. whether it's the best skilled player or it's who they know, you know, that's just the reality of life. And unfortunately I just, I wish it was always all, you know, by skill and by resume, obviously, but that's never mm-hmm. always the case. So you know, and that's why I always say, you know, you got to perform your best. And, and I, and I really preach do outside training. I mean, we have a guy named Aaron Bird who does next level training here at Michigan. I mean, he's got Mm -hmm. in Michigan, he's got Kellen Acosta. He's got Chloe Ricketts who plays for the Washington spirit and the WSL. Um, Maddie Pogart plays for the, uh, was with the thorns. And I think she's with the wave now, San Diego, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think so. Yeah, and I don't know if Bethany Balser for the rain has came in, has come back and trained with Aaron. She's she's from the west side of the state, but Juwan Jones, Brandon By, Russell Cicerone, who plays for Sac Republic, um, Robbie Mertz plays for uh, plays for Pittsburgh Riverhounds. I mean, you play U of M, but Robbie's from Pittsburgh. But all these people make an effort to do extra stuff after outside of training, and and I'm not a believer of the ten thousand hour rule. I think, you know that's that's a lot of effort you're 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 exacerbating into something honestly and i think mm-hmm. you don't need to spend ten ten thousand hours doing something um you need to have a good work-life balance and a good yeah. work-life balance helps you in the long run um you know i mean you know i i can work out and run 10 miles or whatever but i can't do that every day i got to take a day where you know it's a recovery day where i'm walking or you know, I'm doing yoga or something, you know, like there's a day you got to relax and just, you know, be yourself and, and take it easy for a little bit. And, you know, I think now how the, how youth sports have turned in into nowadays, especially youth soccer, you know, is that everyone's got to be doing everything. It's like one to the next, to the next, and it's okay mm-hmm. to take a month off and just work on technical things and, but not have to play all the time. And, you know, and, you know, what I love about a lot of the college coaches, honestly, is, you know, when their season ends, no matter how far they make it to the NCAA tournament or if their season ends, you know, after the conference tournament is, you know, some of the coaches I know, like Damon Renzi in Michigan state tells his guys, Hey, like, don't pick up a ball guys. I don't want you to pick up a ball. I want you to rest. I want you to focus on finals. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's fine. You know, and if kids want to stay in the, get in the work, the weight room and work out still like there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes you just need a break from some stuff and, you know, don't, don't exhaust yourself you know, by trying to do too much and, you know, cause then you start to doubt yourself and you start to be your own critic and you're not getting where you want to be. And, you know, it, goals are important, you know, obviously shorter term goals are, are, are extremely important. Everyone always goes for the long-term goals and, you know, but you need to set your short term goals, short, short term goals, you know, first before you can get to those long-term goals. So, you know, it's, it's just a process. And like they say, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So. 
Yeah, that's great advice. I know I can't even remember if it was a conversation I had with another person on a, on a, on a recording or if it was just an out of, I, I can't remember, but it was in the last day or two. And yeah. we were basically talking about how um, at the end of like the professional seasons, um, the players literally go on, I mean, obviously they have lavish yachts or summer houses or whatever, but they go on vacation and they hang out with their families and friends, you know, and they are not, they're not playing soccer. And, um, so that's definitely something, you know, if you, if you want to mimic the professional game or even collegiate game, you know, make sure you do take time off when you can. I know, um, like here in Utah, um, we've kind of had a little bit of a break currently just because it's winter. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we took some time off for the holidays and it kind of rolled over into a little bit longer than what we had planned. But, you know, we've been taking some time off for some of the teams that have basically been go, go, go going Mm -hmm. since the summer. And so it's been kind of a nice little break for everybody to be able to regroup before we kind of recharge back up for this upcoming Mm -hmm you know, next few months that are going to be more travel and stuff like that. But yep. it's definitely good rest for, for everybody, you know, be able to be with family, friends, whatever they need to do, go on a vacation. Like that's <laughs> not attached to a soccer tournament. Exactly. Exactly. Something that's not <laughs> so. soccer related. All right, team tune in next week for the rest of my interview with Brooks and thanks for kicking it with me and have a great day. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Kick It With Katie Podcast underscore between all the words. You can reach out to me with questions at Kick It With Katie Pod at gmail.com. I also have a feature with SpeakPipe where you can leave me your own voicemail message if you want to be featured on the podcast. Rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.